Hey everybody, this is Pastor Andy and I am really thankful that you're able to join us online and my prayer for you is that God's word would stir your heart deeply this week. While I'm glad that we're able to produce this content for you, I do wanna say these videos are not meant to be a substitute for God's good plan for you to be part of a community of faith. Here at Lakeview Church, we believe that the church is not just a content producer, uh, but it's a spiritual family. It is that community of faith, that fellowship of believers. And our calling is to follow Jesus together for the glory of God and the common good. So we'd love for you, if you're able, to be part of our community of faith. We'd love to get to know you, to hear your story. Uh, we'd love to partner with you in the gospel. Um, and so if you're in the area and you're able to join us in person, we would love to see you and to meet you. If you're not able to do that, we would highly value your prayers. And thank you for uh, partnering with us in the gospel by praying for us. Um, so I hope you enjoy this video and I hope God's word speaks to you deeply. May God bless you and enjoy the rest of your day. All right, so we'll be continuing in our uh, Bible Life Sermon Series. We're going through the Bible in a year. And let's put up this next slide and let me ask a question. How many of you recognize this? If you know what it is, shout it out. Twilight Zone, yes. Now, I haven't seen the remake of The Twilight Zone. I have no idea if it's any good or not. But when I was a kid, I used to watch reruns of The Twilight Zone on Nick at Night at my grandma's house, and it was one of my favorite shows. And one of my favorite episodes of The Twilight Zone is the story, it's the, I think the title of it is The Eye of the Beholder. But it, it tells a story about a woman who is going in for plastic surgery to correct a facial disfigurement. Um, because something is wrong with her face and it's really ugly. And so uh, she's, got, she's had this surgery multiple times and it's never worked and she's all wrapped up in bandages and the hospital staff are all there with their medical masks on and they're caring for her and they go to take the bandages off. When they pull the bandages off, she looks stunningly beautiful and all the staff scream, ah! And then it shows them without their masks and they all have pig faces. <laughs> so she looks normal. They all have pig faces, right? And that's the story. And there's like, you're like, what's the, what's the point of that? I don't know. Uh, if you, if you, I love The Twilight Zone because it's these short little stories that really make you say, huh? What? That's really weird. And the, the reason why I'm telling you this story this morning is because Jesus sometimes told stories like that. Stories that are called parables. Now, a parable is a story that makes you scratch your head and think. That's the whole point of a parable. If you've ever read the, the parables in the Bible, or if you've heard of the parables, or you've read the teaching of Jesus, and you've thought, what in the world does that mean? You're not alone. A lot of people responded to Jesus' parables exactly the same way. In fact, in Matthew chapter 13, verse 10, his disciples came and asked him, why do you speak to them in parables? Why don't you just tell them in plain, clear language what the kingdom of God is like? Why do you tell these stories that make people scratch their heads and say, huh? Right? Parables, that's what they're designed to. And so we're going to, we're going to ask the same question. We might ask it this way. Why should we read parables? Why should we care about them? Why did Jesus teach them? And, and why did he teach in that way? Um, before we jump into that answer, though, let's reorient ourselves with where we are in the Bible's general storyline. If you think of the Bible as a theatrical drama in six acts, we're in Act 4. Started in Act 1, God establishes his kingdom. He created the universe, the world, and everything in it. He created the physical realm and the spiritual realm. He created the first two human beings, Adam and Eve. And he said, you are my image in my kingdom. Be fruitful and multiply. That's what he did when he established the kingdom. In Act 2, Adam and Eve are deceived by Satan, the devil in the form of a serpent. He lies to them and he convinces them to stop trusting God. And because they lose faith in God, they, they decide to take matters in their own hands and they disobey God. And in so doing, they bring in evil and sin and death into God's good kingdom. And God says, I'm not going to leave things a mess like this. I'm actually going to, to do something to fix the problem. Uh, there is going to be a king who will be born who will defeat sin, who will defeat evil, who will defeat even death itself, and will restore my kingdom to what I intended it to be. He promises that that king is going to come. 
And then in Act, the story goes through uh, Noah and the flood. It goes up to Abraham. And then in Act 3, God meets with Abraham. And he says, I promise that someday your descendants will become a nation. Now, we know that nation is called Israel. And he says, that's the nation that I'm going to bring the Savior of the world through. That's the, he's going to be the one that blesses all the nations through your descendants. So that looks like God's plan is kind of starting to come to fruition. Um, and the rest of the Old Testament tells the story of Israel. And we know, because we've spent several months going through it, it's a story of ups and downs. It's all over the map. Sometimes Israel is doing right what God calls them to do, and sometimes Israel is totally disobedient and doing everything wrong. Sometimes they're coming to God to worship him, and sometimes they're running away from God to worship false gods and the idols of the culture around them. And it's a mess, and it's a downward spiral of depravity that gets worse and worse and worse, and eventually the nation of Israel crumbles. Uh, it, it's conquered, and God allows them to be put into exile, and it looks like God's plan isn't going to work. He promised to make a nation. He promised to send somebody who would save the world and restore the kingdom through that nation. But that nation is now conquered and in exile, and it's kind of a mess. And that's where Act 4 picks up. God says, I'm going to send my own son to be that king who will defeat evil and death, who will conquer sin, and who will restore my kingdom. And so that's the coming of the king. We know his name is Jesus. And so we've looked at the life of Jesus. We looked at his uh, birth. We had Christmas in August. Um, we looked at the temptation of Jesus as he faced the temptation of the devil in the wilderness. And he succeeded where Adam and Eve failed. Um, he trusted God and resisted the devil and didn't give in to the temptation. Uh, we looked at one of his miracles. Jesus performed many miracles. We just picked one. And we looked at the miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead. Uh, Jesus taught a lot about the kingdom, and he called 12 ordinary men to be his disciples. And he said, I'm going to show you how to live life in the kingdom of God, and I'm going to teach you how to show others to live life in the kingdom of God. Um, and so today we're going to look at some of Jesus' teaching, where Jesus taught in parables, these short stories that are designed to make you think. Um, and we're only going to look at one parable this morning, but it's just kind of a... Um, a symbol or a, an example of, of the kind of teaching that Jesus gave. Uh, and so that's where we're at. As we go through the series, we'll get into the rest of the New Testament where we see the church and the Christians proclaiming the kingdom of God, and then we'll get into the end times in Act 6 when we look at the return of our king. So that's where we're headed this morning. Let's look at parables. The question that we have is why should we read the parables? Why did Jesus teach in parables? Why did he do that? And he shows us that in Matthew chapter 13. Matthew 13, verse 1. I'm going to be reading it this morning out of the Message Bible. A lot of people ask me what my favorite version of the Bible is. It really depends on what I'm doing. If I'm reading it devotionally, if I'm studying it for a research paper, if I'm preaching it. I like to try to preach whatever version I think most clearly communicates the meaning of the passage. A lot of times that's the ESV, that's the one we use most often. The Message Bible hits a home run this morning with this story. And so you can follow it in whatever version you like, they're all good. It'll be the Message Bible that's up on the screen. Matthew 13, verse 1. At about that same time, Jesus left the house and sat on the beach. In no time at all, a crowd gathered along the shoreline, forcing him to get into a boat. Using the boat as a pulpit, he addressed his congregation, telling stories or parables. So next week, we're all going to go to the beach. Church on the beach. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Lindsay. Yeah, no. Yeah, if we bring your sunscreen and a, and a sweatshirt, apparently it's already fall in Wisconsin. Um, anyway, Jesus is out on the beach. He's in the boat. He's teaching the people in stories or parables. And here's what he says. What do you make of this? A farmer planted seed. As he scattered the seed, some of it fell on the road, and birds ate it. Some fell in the gravel. It sprouted quickly, but didn't put down roots. So when the sun came up, it withered just as quickly. Some fell in the weeds. As it came up, it was strangled by the weeds. Some fell on good earth and produced a harvest beyond his wildest dreams. Are you listening to this? Really listening? The disciples came up and asked, why do you tell stories? <laughs> you can imagine, imagine just coming to church on a Sunday morning, and instead of opening the Bible 
and reading a passage from Psalms or from one of the epistles and, and talking about what it means. Imagine that I got up and I said, uh, here's a story about a man who bought a combine and he harvested all the grain in his field and he put it in his barns, in his grain silos, and then he went and sold it at market value. Everybody have a great week. I hope you enjoyed uh, the, the service today. You'd be saying, huh, what? This is church. Aren't we supposed to talk about the Bible? Aren't we supposed to talk about God's word and God's kingdom? They were having the same reaction. Why are you telling stories about a farmer planting seeds in his field? And Jesus does something really interesting here in Matthew 13. He answers their question. <laughs> he tells them not only why he teaches in parables, he also explains what this parable means. Now, Jesus doesn't do that usually in the rest of the Gospels. He leaves it for us to puzzle it out. But he actually tells us in this story why he teaches in parables and what this parable that he's just told means. So here's the, here's the first point. Why does Jesus teach in parables, or why should we read parables? Well, we should read them because parables don't give us the answers, but they point us to the one who answers. Parables aren't the destination, they're the road signs along the way. A lot of people, when they uh, come to read the Bible, they're, they're uh, looking at it kind of like an ancient version of chat GPT or Google. I have a specific question or a specific challenge or a specific problem, and I need God's word or God's will in this area of my life. And if you come to that and you open it up and you say, I'm going to see what Jesus has to say, and you read a story about farmer planting seeds in a field, and you say, ah, the Bible has no relevance to my life today. And they walk away in frustration. But we have to understand, Jesus didn't tell the parables to give us the answers to our questions. He told us the parables to spark our curiosity so that we would search for what they mean. And in the searching, we find the one who answers. We find Jesus. We find Christ. As we are looking, as we are searching, we find him. This is what he, was, uh, what he told his disciples. When they, when they came and said, why do you tell stories? Why do you teach in parables? Verse 11, he replied, you've been given insight into God's kingdom. You know how it works. Not everybody has this gift, this insight. It hasn't been given to them. Whenever someone has a ready heart, for this, the insights and understandings flow freely. But if there's no readiness, any trace of receptivity soon disappears. And look at verse 13. That's why I tell stories. Here's why. Why did Jesus tell stories? Why do parables matter? To create readiness. To nudge people toward receptive insight. In their present state, they can stare till doomsday and not see it. Listen till they're blue in the face and not get it. And he says, I don't want Isaiah's forecast to be repeated all over again. Here's what the prophet Isaiah spoke. Your eyes are open, but you don't hear a thing. Your, ear, your, sorry, your ears are open, but you don't hear a thing. Your eyes are awake, but you don't see a thing. All right, Jesus tells the stories and the parables not to give us the answer, but to spark our curiosity to make us look for the answer. It's in the searching we find not the answer all the time, but we find Jesus. And Jesus is the answer, capital A, answer that we need. Right? That's why he taught the stories, to, tell, to, to stir our hearts to readiness. What he means when he's telling this to the disciples is this. You can't understand the truth until your heart is ready to search for the truth. You'll never understand it. You could look at it all day until you're blue in the face. You could hear it on every podcast that's, that's broadcast out there. But unless your heart is in a place of openness and searching for truth, you'll never understand the truth. And a lot of people today aren't really looking for what's true and what's real. They're looking for what confirms the ideas that they already think. I'm not really interested in searching for truth. I just want to listen to a podcast that confirms all my preconceived ideas. And you can find it. Any, anything that you already think, you can find confirmation out there on the internet. And Jesus says, you won't really understand what's real and what's true until your heart is ready to search for it and to receive it. And the parables get your heart ready to search for truth. They spark your curiosity. They make you think. They give you a puzzle that needs to be solved. Anybody like Wordle? 
Right? I love that kind of stuff. Solving the puzzle. Uh, they give you a treasure that needs to be found. That's what the parables do. They're, are you willing to search for the treasure? I love um, the Sherlock Holmes stories. In fact, I've got all the Sherlock Holmes stories in a two-volume set, uh, and I, I just I totally geek out on that stuff. One of the reasons I like Sherlock Holmes is because he sees things that nobody else sees, and he figures out things that nobody else figures out, and he solves crimes that nobody else can solve because he looks at them differently than the way everybody else looks at them. And because he's not just searching to confirm what he already thinks, but he's searching for what is real and true, he always seems to find the the one clue that solves the crime. I love those stories, and that's what Jesus is doing with the parables. He's getting us into that mode of searching, because it's in the searching that we find something far more valuable than an answer. We find Christ himself. You've probably heard the saying, uh, give a man a fish, feed him for a day, teach a man to fish, feed him for a lifetime. Well, we could say this about the parables. Uh, give a man an answer, and he has one answer. Teach a man to search for Jesus, and he has all the answers he'll ever need. That's what the parables do. See, being a disciple of Jesus is not about being a mature Christian. Being a disciple about Jesus, of Jesus is about being a person who has learned to search for Jesus every day. That's what a, a disciple is. It's not a, it doesn't matter how many Bible verses you have memorized or how many books of the Bible you can quote in order or if you can write a theology paper about the end times. Being a disciple is, means have you learned to search for Jesus every day? Because when you search for him, you will find him. So the question we have here is what are you searching for? What are you looking for in life? What are you devoting the the mental energy and your time and your emotional capacity to search for? Are you looking for Jesus at work? Are you looking for Jesus at home? Are you looking for Jesus at school? Are you looking for Jesus in your family? Because if you're looking for him, you'll find him. That's what the parables do. They lead us to the one who answers. Number two, parables reveal the condition of our hearts and the contradiction of our lives. In other words, parables show us where we're at with God and where our lives are inconsistent with God's kingdom. That's why they're important. This is what Jesus shows when he teaches his disciples the meaning of this parable of the farmer planting seeds on different kinds of soil. And this is what he says in verse 18. He says, study this story of the farmer planting seed. When anyone hears news of the kingdom or the gospel, or the word of God, when anyone hears news of the kingdom and doesn't take it in, it just remains on the surface. And so the evil one comes along and plucks it right out of that person's heart. This is the seed the farmer scatters on the road. The seed cast in the gravel, this is the person who hears and instantly responds with enthusiasm. But there's no soil of character And so when the emotions wear off and some difficulty arrives, there's nothing to show for it. The seed cast in the weeds is the person who hears the kingdom news, but weeds of worry and illusions about getting more and wanting everything under the sun strangle what was heard, and nothing comes of it. The seed cast on good earth is the person who hears and takes in the news and then produces a harvest beyond his wildest dreams." He tells us the meaning of this story, and he said, what he's saying is, parables reveal the condition of our hearts. How you receive and respond to God's word reveals the condition of your heart, where you're at with God. In the story, there are are different kinds of soil. They all receive the same seed. They all have a different response, right? Different soils, different people, different hearts, different responses to God's word. And how we receive and respond to it reveals the condition of our heart. So the question, therefore, that all of us should be asking right now is, how do I receive and respond to God's word? What do I do when I hear the gospel, when I hear the good news of God's kingdom, when I hear God's word? Do I dismiss it? Do I ignore it? Do I do, this is what I sometimes do, wow, my wife really needed to hear that sermon today. What about me, right? Do I use the Bible as a mirror to examine my own heart or do I use it as binoculars to scrutinize the lives of others? How do I receive and respond to God's word? 
is following Jesus like going to the gym in January? You go to the gym in January, it's packed. You have to wait in line to use the, the weights and different things, right? Everybody is so excited. I'm going to get in shape and lose weight. And, uh, go to the gym in February. It's empty. <laughs> you can use any machine you want, never have to wait in line, right? Because everybody gets all excited about it, and then their enthusiasm wears off. Is that how life with Jesus is? Oh, I'll get really excited about it on Sunday. By Tuesday, I'm kind of lost in the worries of life and the busyness and my, what my boss said to me the other day and whatever, right? Or, or, or do you cultivate life together with Christ? Do you cultivate it with your church family? Do you hear God's word planted in your heart by the Holy Spirit? And do you gather with brothers and sisters in Christ to cultivate that, to, to talk about what it means, how you apply it, how you live it out in the real world, and let it grow and produce a harvest in your life? Parables reveal the condition of our hearts. They also reveal the contradiction in our lives. Sometimes our lives don't align with how God wants us to live, and parables reveal that. Jesus said this in verse 15. He said, the people are blockheads. <laughs> I love that. You're a blockhead, Charlie Brown. <laughs> the people are blockheads. They stick their fingers in their ears so they won't have to listen. They screw their eyes shut so they won't have to look, so they won't have to deal with me face to face and let me heal them. Here's the picture that he's painting. I'm not listening. I'm not listening. I'm not listening. I'm not listening. Now, the thing, that's, the thing that's ironic about that is these people are God's people. God's people. And God says, open your eyes. Open your ears. Look me in the face. I want to heal you. And God's people are like, no, 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 no. So ironic, inconsistent. They're God's people, but they're blind to the God in the flesh standing right in front of them, right? And, and parables reveal those inconsistencies in our lives. Here are a few examples of that. One of the most famous parables Jesus told is the parable of the Good Samaritans in Luke chapter 10. A Jewish man is on the road. He gets waylaid by robbers. They beat him up. They leave him for dead. They take everything he has. He's lying there in a puddle of his own blood about to die. Different people walk by, a, a priest, a Levite, good people that should be helping him. Instead, they cross to the other side of the road and they go right on by and leave him there. Then a Samaritan comes by. And the key to understanding that story is understanding the relationship between the Jews and the Samaritans. Absolute, complete, and utter hatred. Worst enemies. The Samaritan gets down and he goes over to that Jewish man who's lying in a puddle of his own blood and he picks him up and he bandages his wounds and he takes him and he cares for him and nurses him back to health at his own expense. And the point of the parable is that you should treat your worst enemy the, tr the way you treat your favorite neighbor. Whew. Reveals the contradiction in our lives, right? Here's another one. The parable of the unforgiving servant in Matthew chapter 18. The story is there's a servant who owes a king an exorbitant amount of money. He's in debt way over his head. He could give the king his entire annual salary every year for the rest of his life and still not pay off the debt. So he comes to the king and he says, I don't have the money to pay you back and I never will. Can you please forgive the debt? And the king, in an amazing act of generosity, says, yes, I'll forgive this massive debt that you owe me. The servant leaves, having just been forgiven this debt, and one of his friends comes up to him. And his friend says, hey, you know you loaned me a tiny little bit of money recently? I don't have the money to pay that back. Can you forgive me? And this servant, instead of saying, hey, I just got forgiven a massive debt by the king, I can forgive you that little debt. Instead, he chokes the man out. The king hears about it, is furious. He calls a servant in and he says, how in the world could you not forgive your friend who owed you a little bit when I just forgave you who owed me an entire lifetime worth of salary? And he throws the man in prison, right? And the point of the story is, for those of us who have been forgiven in Christ, our, the entire debt of our sin has been forgiven through the cross of Jesus Christ. We are justified with God. How in the world could we fail to extend forgiveness to somebody who sinned against us? 
When we have received such mercy, such grace through the, the, the death and resurrection of Christ, how could we not extend that to other people? Instead, how often do we say, I am I'm choosing to be offended by what this person said about me or how this person spoke to me. How dare they? Instead of forgiving because we've been forgiven, right? It reveals the contradiction in our lives. Here's a, a, another example. In Matthew chapter 18, the parable of the lost sheep. Jesus says that, uh, the good shepherd leaves the 99 sheep in the middle of the field and he goes into the wilderness in search of the one who's missing and he brings him back and brings him home. The parable of the lost sheep reveals God's great heart for the lost in the world. But how often, or, or maybe I'll say it this way, when was the last time we even thought about the people who live next door who don't know Jesus? Let alone thought about their eternal salvation. When was the last time we even thought about them? God has this huge heart for the lost. And we're so wrapped up in ourselves. It reveals the contradiction in our lives. Uh, uh, the last example I'll, I'll give is the parable of the prodigal son from Luke chapter 15, another one of Jesus' most popular uh, parables. In the story, a young man comes to his dad and he says, I want my share of the inheritance now. And so the dad gives him his share of his inheritance and he leaves and he goes and squanders it all in wild living and partying with his friends. Eventually he winds up completely destitute, homeless, he doesn't have anything, and he realizes even my dad's servants are living better than I am right now. Now, I, I've messed things up at home. I don't deserve to be my dad's son anymore, but maybe he'll give me a job. So he decides to go home and ask for a job. And what he doesn't know is that every day since he left, the dad's been standing on the porch of the house, looking down the road, waiting for his son to come home. And as soon as he sees the boy round the curve, the dad jumps up and sprints to him and wraps him up in his arms. And his son says, I don't deserve to be your son. Can I have a job? And his dad says, no, you cannot have a job. You're my son. Are you kidding me? Welcome home. And the point of the story is there is no sin too great for Christ's forgiveness. There is no depravity that is greater than the grace of God. No matter how far away from God you've run, he's right there with his arms open wide, waiting for you to come home. No matter what you've done, no matter what's been done to you, no matter how far away from God you think you've been, no matter what you've said, God is right there saying, turn around, come home, come home. The parables reveal God's heart. They reveal our hearts. They reveal our, where we're at with him. They show us where our lives are inconsistent. Do we believe that no matter how desperately we've sinned, God can still forgive us? Are we willing to come home? The parables don't give us the answers. They point us to Jesus, who is the one who answers. And they reveal where we're at with God. And, and they're designed to make us think so I'm going to invite the worship team to come up, and I want us to spend a few minutes thinking and reflecting and contemplating on God's Word. The parable that Jesus told at the beginning of Matthew 13 is about a farmer who planted seed in different kinds of soil. And the seed, Jesus tells us, is a symbol of the gospel, the good news of the kingdom of God. So I want to put myself in the shoes of the farmer, and I want to scatter some seed out to you this morning, and I want it to sit in the soil of your heart as we contemplate and reflect on that and do what parables call us to do, which is think. Let's just practice this together. Here's the seed of the kingdom. The gospel of Jesus Christ is about running. The gospel of Jesus is about running. You say, what? running? What does that mean? The gospel is about sin and grace, and sin and grace are both about running. Sin is you running away from God. Grace is God running after you to intercept you and to save you from self-destruction. The sin is when we run away from God, and we all do it. We've all done it. We all do it sometimes. And as we run away from God, we're running right into a barbed wire fence. We're running right off the edge of a cliff. And so God says, I love you too much to let you run off the edge of that cliff. I love you too much to let you run into that self-destructive behavior. I'm going to run after you, and I'm going to intercept you. And God puts obstacles in our path. He makes life difficult for us. Sometimes he allows us to experience success and then pulls the joy right out of it. So it doesn't satisfy. Why? Because he's being a mean jerk? No. 
because he's trying to show us the path that you're on leads into the barbed wire fence. You're about to implode. I don't want to save you from that self-destructive behavior. So I am running after you and I am putting these obstacles to interfere with your life so that you'll come back and come home. And you'll know that joy is in Christ. Love is in Christ. Meaning is in Christ. Come home. Sin is you running away from God. Grace is God running after you and intercepting you to save you from self-destruction. Let's contemplate that. And I'll walk us through a contemplative prayer. And here's how we're going to guide that time. Where in your life are you running from God? How is God intercepting you? Can you see that interference as his grace that saves you from self-destruction? And then we're going to ask God what he wants us to do. Let's walk through this together. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming and teaching in these parables that lead us into life with you. We find you in the searching. And so, God, we're going to sit this morning and we're going to contemplate this seed of the gospel. We run away from you. You run after us. So, Lord, would you just bring to our hearts right now an area in our lives that we are running away from you? Accept that. Whatever it was that came to your heart, just admit, yes, I've been running away from God in that area of my life. Lord, would you show us the ways that you are intercepting us? Obstacles, challenges, difficulties that in actuality are you course correcting in our lives. Would you show us those things? challenges are. Sometimes, Lord, it is hard for us to accept difficulty in life as an act of grace from you. Would you give us the grace that we need to see your interference as calling us back home, as bringing us off a path of self-destruction so that we can find life in Christ? Give us the grace we need to see it that way and to look at the trials in life from a different perspective. God, as we close this time of contemplation and prayer, church family, I want you to ask God yourself, what would you have me do? What would you have me do? Whatever comes to your heart, I want you to write it down, and I want you to think about doing it this week. How can you do it this week? God, would you answer that question as we sit and as we sing and as we pray? In Jesus' name.